Welcome to the teaching ministry of Vision Calvary Chapel, where we teach the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. So join us for today's study to watch, listen, and learn, knowing that the Word of God always works. We're going to talk about the second subject of a wonderful day is coming, and that is a day of repentance. Take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 64. Uh, Recently, a man told me, he said, hey, I read some negative stuff about you and why churches don't want to listen to you anymore. I said, well, why is that? He said that you talk all the time about repentance, and it makes people uncomfortable. Oh, such a shame. Well, you'll see why that's so important right now. You got your Bible open, Isaiah 64. There are just 12 verses here. Talking to God. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, tear them. Thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we, we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, Men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen. O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth on him, or for him. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned. In those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a thief, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, here comes the second time that we heard this. Thou art our Father. We are the clay, thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. Be not wroth or angry very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem a desolation. Our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praise thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste. Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Good question. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it's easy. We can get tired, worn out, and not listen very well. But I pray, Lord, in this time together that we will understand the need of repentance. You've made it clear to your people to repent, to turn away from their wickedness, and to turn unto the Lord. God, I pray that many of us will turn to the Lord before it's too late. In the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray these things. Amen. Now, it is true, in my opinion, that America, and especially the believers in America, whether they are Jewish or Gentile, are in great need of repentance. We are also in great need of revival. Revival is not for unbelievers. Revival is for believers to get right with God. God has promised over and over again, if we would turn from our wicked ways, he would hear from 
heaven and would forgive our sin and would heal our land. You know, I love the Jewish flag. It's sitting out there on the tables. And I've noticed on several websites that people are attacking that flag. They said that it comes from Persian Zoroastrianism. Wrong. They don't believe that Israel's history proves about that flag. With that Jewish star of six points. What's the truth? Well, Numbers tells us that a star will arise out of Jacob and unto him will be the obedience of all the peoples of the world. The star is messianic and that's what David Ben-Gurion said in 1948 when he announced the name of this land is Eretz Israel, exactly the way Ezekiel said it would be. Eretz means land, land of Israel. He announced the flag. The flag is a prayer shawl. Don't ever forget it. That white with a blue stripe, that's a prayer shawl. And you know what the verse was that David Ben-Gurion announced to the world? Will be the theme verse of the nation of Israel. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Listen, folks. The current elected Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, in my book, I don't care how skilled you think he is or isn't, but I'll tell you, any man that has told the Knesset, the Parliament of Israel, that I will have a Bible study in my home after the Shabbat is over on Saturday night, and my rabbi, Rabinowitz, is going to teach Bible prophecy from the book of Isaiah. He's my kind of prime minister. You know, they're still running 50 to 60 guys out of the parliament, 120, coming to the home of the prime minister. Oh, and before he came to Congress, he went to the Wailing Wall. And they asked him what he's doing there. He said, I am praying that the Lord God of Israel will give me the words to say that will show people the danger that we're in. Hey, if a man is a prime minister and he's doing that praying, I wish our president would pray. Amen? I was in Canada not too long ago and I gave him a deal. I said, I want to make you people a deal. You know, the Prime Minister of Canada, Mr. Stephen Harper, is a Bible believer. Israel has announced recently that he and Mike Huckabee are the two most loyal supporters of Israel in political nations of the world. As a matter of fact, they've added now one more since Thursday. Thursday, Mark Rubio gave one of the most stunning speeches supporting Israel I've ever heard. You can read it on worldnetdaily.com. It's all there. He only had 6% of all those 15 candidates that are going to run for the Republican president. He had only 6%. Oh, he's minor. He's a... Do you know what happened after the speech? He shot to the top. He's number one. All because of what? because he was willing to confront our president and all the administration's attitudes about Israel and to say this nation is supporting the nation of Israel with all of our hearts. Israel, in all their articles, said it was one of the greatest speeches ever. Wow. It's interesting, isn't it, what's happening? It was me at a major conference who said 20 years ago, I believe that Israel is going to become the major issue in America. It certainly has, faster than I thought. So, I was in Canada and I know about Mr. Stephen Harper. His uh, secretary actually orders books from us at Hope for Today. That shows you their intelligence, amen? <laughs> 
So I said to an audience of 2,000 people in Canada, I make you a deal. I'll give you Barack Obama for Stephen Harper. And 2,000 people stood up and shouted, boo. <laughs> it's not just America, it's also Canada. And I like what one lady, 86 years old, wrote in her column. She said, as enough is enough. I am tired and they are never going to keep me quiet again. Israel is a nation founded by God Almighty. And it certainly is more important than the United States of America. And I have been a patriot for years. Wow. So what is needed? What is needed, folks, is the same in Israel as it is in America. What is needed is repentance. And it needs to start with God's people. I don't care what church, Metho, Bacterian, whatever you are. I'm glad you're here. And I want you to know that God wants us to repent. Wow. I hope you're ready. So let's start. Number one, on the day of repentance. If I'm reading my Bible correctly, you can look at yours, Isaiah 64, the first four verses. What we have here is asking for God's awesome presence to be demonstrated. Oh, that thou wouldst tear the heavens and come down, that the mountains will flow down at your presence to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Well, there's a picture here of his presence indeed. Mountains flowing down, the very thing we wouldn't expect to happen. And the purpose of this display is to make thy name known to all nations of the world. Wow. By the way, did you know that the mountains are going to be moved by the God? In fact, every mountain will be moved out of its place. Those were Jewish prophets that mentioned that, and the New Testament picked up that truth and repeated it again. Every island is going to be moved out of its place. We saw when that tsunami hit Indonesia that that whole island of Indonesia moved 21 feet. And scientists who study the matter said we have never seen anything like this. But in the Bible, every island will be moved out of its place and all the mountains will be brought low. God's going to demonstrate his power. And the power he has displayed in the past, according to this passage, was not expected. My dear friends, I don't care what nuclear power or weapons any nation has. The United States, by the way, has the most. So there's a little hypocrisy there, isn't there? Not only do we have the most, but Russia has a great number of nuclear weapons. Oh, China also has been climbing the ladder of nuclear weapons, but we haven't got upset at them, have we? We're fearful of them. Why? Because there, there's so many of them. I tell people I believe God loves Chinese people more than anybody else because <laughs> he made so many of them. Amen? God is going to really uproot our confidence in the planet that we live on. <coughs> Scary days are ahead. But the praise they gave to him is mentioned in verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither had the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. O Lord, show us. 
1 Corinthians 2 picks up that prophet's message and says, As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither is entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. You know something? It's not talking about blessing you in this life now. The quote is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. It is talking about what God is going to do on the planet to demonstrate his power that men might realize they need to repent. Wow. Did you know there's a whole period of time called the tribulation? Its proper biblical name is the day of the Lord. That's why I wrote a book about it. The day of the Lord is coming. 25 times the Hebrew prophets warned us the day of the Lord is coming. It won't be a blessing. It'll be darkness and gloom and sorrow and pain and death. And that day is coming over one half of the world's population will be dead before it is half over. Who's kidding who? No wonder churches don't want to study prophecy. They're scared to death of what it says. And so they try to reinterpret it, which is impossible if you study the Hebrew prophets. Now, a commercial, okay? Here's the commercial. I have done a whole series on the Minor Prophets, the 12, with PowerPoint, all of that. And it is currently on internet television. You can watch it on Wednesday mornings at 4 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Or you can watch it on Friday mornings at 5 a.m. Or you could have watched it today at 12 noon, every Saturday. It's on the Minor Prophets. Today it was about Joel, and boy does he smash us with those words of the day of the Lord is coming. Now, friends, 1 Corinthians 2, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things that God's prepared for those that love him. It will be a blessing for us. It is a wonderful day that is coming. Thank God there's going to be a day of revenge. Our Messiah is going to destroy all the nations and their armies that thought they could come and attack Israel, his people. It will be a bloodbath in Israel. The blood flowing to the horses' bridles and staining all the garments of the Messiah of Israel himself. We learned about that last night. First Corinthians goes on to say, What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man that is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. If you want to know what's going to happen, then we have to trust the Holy Spirit, who is the true author of the book, as we learned in the last session. Wow. The second thing I would draw to your attention is from verses 5 to 7. And that deals with awareness of sin. I don't believe, and I'm not the authority, God is. But I do not believe that people truly repent without being aware of their sin. A lot of times something's happened in the past and you know what you did was wrong, but you hope the years will cover it and you don't have to deal with it. The Bible says that all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to deal. It will not escape the notice of God. He will not wipe it out or stop remembering it unless we repent and get right with the Lord. You say, well, what does that mean? I'm gonna tell you before we're done. I'm gonna drive you crazy with it. Because I do not believe that the churches of this generation are comfortable teaching people about true biblical repentance. Wonderful article on Aretz Sheva, Israel's number one news site, 
they have several articles by Jewish rabbis and there was a wonderful argument about repentance. I loved reading it. As that Jewish rabbi fully understood, we can't hide from the Lord God of Israel. He knows it all. He knows everything we've ever done that's wrong. And we need to repent. Shuvah Yisrael, return, repent, turn, O Israel. If you want God's blessing. You see, their confession here is clear. Verse 5, could it be any more clear? We have sinned. Do you have the courage to say before God and others that you offended or hurt, no matter when it was? I have sinned. Joshua told Achan, confess your sin before God and give glory to the God of Israel. You see, their corruption was acknowledged. They knew that all the so-called righteous deeds they were doing was like filthy rags in God's sight. How about you and me? Do we recognize that? Number three, their calling upon his name was absent. It says, there is none that calleth upon thy name. If our hearts are tender towards the Lord, that mention alone should cause us to cry unto the Lord right now in our hearts so nobody next to you, even spouse and family, though they do not know what you are feeling, the Lord God does. And in your heart, we need to call on his name. If my people, theme verse of Israel, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You see, the consequences of their sin was clearly understood. You can read that right there in verse seven. Two things, what are they? One, separation from God. Wow. Thou hast hid thy face from us. You know, um, I don't want to become too mystical or psycho-babbling, but you know, I walk into a church and I may be going to have a conference there, and I know this sounds a little too emotional, and I'm not that way normally, but I walk into a church and I can feel that things aren't right. I can sense whether it comes from the Spirit of God or my own feelings, I don't know. But later, time proves that there was something wrong there. I had a man who was bragging to me about his ministry and telling me how wonderful he was. And I don't know. It was like the Spirit of God came upon my mind. And I said to him, how long have you been having the affair? I took a chance. He said, who told you? I said, nobody. You know, you might be trying to shine in front of other people, but God knows the truth about us all. Be sure your sin will find you out. That's why repentance is not happening. We're trying to cover and hide. Yet Proverbs said, he who covers his sin will not prosper. That's what God said. Let's take a look at the, um, the second appeal they made to the Lord. That's actually how this little chapter of 12 verses is divided. And in that second section, beginning at verse 8 down to verse 12, this included their relationship to the Lord. 
that beautiful statement which was said earlier in the passage of last night. Thou art our father. We're the clay. You're the potter. You know, sometimes we walk around like we think we're the potter, that we're controlling the circumstances of our life. No, we aren't. God is. Now, God is not causing you to sin. The Bible's clear about that in James 1, 13 to 15. But when you sin and you decide to cover it or not deal with it, as I'm going to show you before we're through, we're in deep trouble. You may think nobody knows. <laughs> the Lord God of Israel knows. He knows exactly what's going on in your heart and life. Not only separation from God, but also suffering God's judgment, it says, and you have consumed us. We are the clay, you are the potter. And that included also their recognition of his hand in their lives. We all are the work of thy hand. You're in charge, we're not. And it included their request for the Lord's forgiveness. Neither remember iniquity forever. Well, he won't if we repent. It also, interestingly, included their realization of what would happen in the future. Verse 10 and 11 is stunning. The holy cities will become a wilderness. Don't, don't be wroth, don't be angry, Lord. You see, it did include their complete reliance upon the Lord to act. Verse 12, the last verse of that chapter says, Wilt thou refrain thyself for these things, O Lord? The answer is, no, he will not. I'm so glad that we have chapter 65 and 66, a day of restoration and a day of rejoicing. But let's talk for a moment about repentance. The Jewish Bible called the Old Testament or the Tanakh, which represents a threefold division of the Old Testament in a Jewish Bible. It speaks about repentance over and over and over again. There is one passage in the New Testament that expands on that truth in the Jewish Bible when it teaches there are seven things that characterize true repentance. Before we get to that, let's take a look at what we have. Joel 2, 12 to 13. Therefore now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend, or tear your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and it repents him of the evil. Hosea 14, 1 and 2. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God. Thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words, and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity, and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. In Zechariah 1, 3, and 4, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways, and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Now, I'd like all of you, if you have a Bible with a New Testament in it, some of you are smiling. Most people feel, well, I got the New Testament, I don't need the old. <laughs> no. Uh, what you need to do is to go to the 
Hebrew University in Jerusalem to the postgraduate department. And what you're going to do is you're going to have to translate the Greek New Testament back into Hebrew, the language of the first century. Amen? Won't that be fun? So before you go, you're going to have to be proficient in Greek too. Astounding, isn't it? I'm going to show you the significance of that now as it relates to repentance. Repentance is a Jewish word. It has two aspects to it, positive and negative. Negative, turn from the sin and the iniquity. Positive, turn to the Lord. Do not forget either one of those. Wow. So, what do we have in the New Testament? Take your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 to 11. There are three verses in the New Testament that teach you exactly what the biblical repentance of Jewish people meant by the prophets of Israel who thundered forth to turn to the Lord and turn away from your sin. Now it's time for us who claim to be messianic. Well, if you are, then we all need to repent Jewish style. Amen? Are you ready for it? I don't know. One man where I was preaching on this subject thundered out of the church and lady at the door says, where are you going? He said, this is nothing but a Jewish thing. And he went out the door. She came to me afterwards and said, that was a great compliment. There's nothing but a Jewish thing. You see, that's why I wrote the book, The Church of Jesus Christ, and it has nothing to do with Mormons. It tells you about the Jewish roots of our faith. It helps us to understand why so much that we do is absolutely stupid, vain, pagan, and awful. I'm, I'm asked not too long ago to participate in a wedding at a big cathedral type church. I'm not comfortable there. The pastor said, uh, well, you're kind of a big guy, but we've ordered a special robe for you. I said, am I required to wear a robe to perform a wedding? He said, well, we don't require it. He said, I said, good, then I will. What? What if I said it was required? Then I wouldn't. <laughs> Do I have to wear that jewelry you put around your neck? That is so corrupt. That is very pagan, you know. He said, David, I've heard you on the radio a lot. I know what you're like. Please, don't mess up this couple's wedding. <laughs> I'm not going to mess it up. I'm just going to preach the truth. I don't want to wear the robe and all that junk around your neck. He said, why? Because it has nothing to do with the pastors of the New Testament. That's why. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> it is traditional that we should wear a coat and tie. Why? That's why women live longer than men. We're slowly choking to death by wearing ties. What in the world is wrong with us? You know, I stopped wearing ties long before it was popular. And I was criticized almost every week. One lady kept buying me white shirts with French cuffs and ties. I had a stack of them. She would deliver one to my office every week. She said, I'm so tired of seeing your so-called sport shirts. Those Hawaiian things are disgusting. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Did you get to New Testament, 2 Corinthians? I gave you time. <laughs> Amen? Paul wrote, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to what? Repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Now watch this. Godly sorrow works 
repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing, that you sorrowed after a godly sort, let's say you really repented, then look at these things. One, what carefulness it wrought in you. Two, what clearing of yourselves. Three, what indignation. Four, what fear. Five, what vehement desire. Six, what zeal. Seven, yea, what revenge. In all things, you've approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Now, before I break it down, let me tell you a little bit more about the word repentance. In the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew word is primarily nakam. Nakam is used 40 times, and practically every one of them are of God. Wow. It also means to lament or to grieve. But the one that perhaps affects us more as Jewish people is the word shuva. Shuva is translated as repent, but it's used 185 times with the word turn. And if you're talking about turn again because you've messed up again, you'll find it 369 times. In other words, the Jewish Bible is dominated by the need of repentance. In the New Testament, we have a Greek word, metamelomai. It's found eight times, and it means you felt sorry for what you did and how you messed up other people's lives. Wow. But the primary Greek word is metanoieo. Noieto, or nous, or naos, is referring to the mind. Meta means after, it's referring to a change. In other words, a change of mind will lead to a change of conduct if you have truly repented. Various forms of the English word for repentance appears 104 times in the King James of the Bible. Biblical repentance sometimes refers to non-believers who turn away from a sinful lifestyle to turn unto the Lord. It is the first word of the gospel. Repent and believe. That's the order. Uh, did you notice these people when you were reading your New Testament? John the Baptist, Matthew 3. He preached a baptism of repentance. Oh, by the way, John the Baptist was not a Baptist preacher. He's Jewish. I hope that doesn't offend you. John the Baptist was Jewish, and he preached repentance to his generation. Do you know the Bible teaches in the Gospels that everybody from Jerusalem and all Judea went down to the Jordan River to get baptized by John to repent of their sin? Wow, he must have been a powerful speaker. No, <laughs> it was the Holy Spirit of God that came upon him. Wow. And how about Jesus? Jesus continued. In fact, in Matthew 4, after hearing about what they did to John, Jesus began to preach saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Bible's filled with it. And then when you go to the last words of Jesus, recorded in the book of Revelation, which, by the way, is really a Jewish Old Testament book. The first time I ever did a commentary on Revelation called The Coming World Leader, 280 pages, I found myself, without computers, over, you ready? 400 quotations from the Old Testament. Wow. Did you know that Hebrew University, in its post-grad department, they have found 721 quotes from the Old Testament, and in one Jewish book it says, 
it seems like the only thing in Revelation that's not in the Jewish Bible are the names of the seven churches. That even the things said about them is in the Jewish Bible. Revelation is a Jewish book. So is Hebrews. So is Romans. Wow. How about Simon Peter? <laughs> Day of Pentecost. What did he say? Be sure to come to our musical tonight and you will enjoy. No. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And how about the Apostle Paul? Paul said the times of this ignorance God has winked at, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Repentance in the Bible is used for believers who know they have sinned against God and haven't dealt with it. They haven't dealt with the consequences and are not willing to restore the damage they have done. They won't even give that call or write that letter asking for forgiveness for what they have done. It deals with a holiness that turns from your wickedness and decides to live a godly, righteous life before God. By the way, there are two examples in the New Testament of men who thought they repented, but they only felt sorry for what they had done. They never did anything about it to change anything. One was Judas, and the other was Esau. Wow. Unbelievable. So, let's take a look at the seven characteristics of repentance. Was I to shut off at 415 still? Amen. Okay, here we go. Number one, we have the word carefulness. What is it talking about? The Greek word is a word that you might know. Spude. That's a sporting company who makes shorts and things. Spude is used 14 times and refers to the speed or eagerness with which a person responds when they're confronted. A lot of us try to rationalize and defend ourselves and just get away from it all. Number two is clearing of yourselves. The Greek word you probably know in English also, apology, apologia. It refers to a defense that's rooted in the desire to be forgiven for what you have done to hurt somebody. It's used eight times. Number three is indignation. What is indignation? We sometimes say, well, he's very indignant. That isn't the meaning of the word. The Greek word is only used here. Ag anak tesis. Very unusual word. But what it's talking about is pain. The pain that you feel you have caused by sinning against somebody else. Wow. Number four is fear. The Greek word phobos. Primarily that's an attitude toward God. You fear the consequences of your action by not dealing with it, you're going to pay for it someday. Somewhere down the road of life, you are going to pay for unforgiven and unrepentant sin. Wow. A fear of consequence. But we have uh, three more. One called vehement desire in the old King James. Uh, the Greek word epi, epipothesis. It's used four times. What it's referring to is the conviction that the Holy Spirit places on your heart. It's a strong desire to respond to God like He wants you to and to do it as soon as you can. Wow. Number six is zeal. Another common word. If a person is zealous, it refers to the effort and desire of their heart. 
to stop their sinful behavior or to apologize and restore whatever was broken and hurt. And that from then on you're living a godly life and getting the wrong out of your life. And you are zealous about it. And finally, revenge. The Greek word is used nine times. And it's referring to judgment as well as defense. What it is is a willing acceptance of the judgment of God and the consequences of disgrace, shame, humiliation, and loss. And there's no effort in this person to justify, defend, or excuse the sinful behavior. Wow. Because some of this is hard to retain in our minds and hearts, I give you this simple little summary. Maybe you'd like to write it down. Based on what God taught, both among the Jewish prophets as well as the New Testament writers, what is repentance? Number one, you respond as soon as possible to the situation. I spoke about this many years ago and a gentleman and his wife who was involved in a ministry I started in Ohio. He came up to me afterwards and he said, uh, I have been justifying my behavior towards my mother. I said, who is your mother? She runs one of the largest brothels in California. She's had seven different husbands. Four of them tried to kill me. I hate her and everything she represents. And this morning as you preached on this, I realized I got to do something about this. I said, well, you could start with the phone. She won't listen to me on the phone. Well, then write her a letter. You write that letter, I'll help you with it. Let's do it. I'm happy to tell you that that gentleman from 50 years ago is still a wonderful Bible teacher because that day he wrote his mother, told him how sorry he was for his attitudes toward her. And could she find it in her heart to forgive him for his anger? She was shocked. But his mother not only came to know the Lord, stopped running the brothel, and one day in church, I saw her and all of her <laughs> girls. They marched in, scared the daylights out of people in the church. And as soon as I gave the invitation, she ordered all of them down front. <laughs> they got on their knees and asked God to forgive them. You know, there's a lot of things like that. I probably should have saved them and wrote about them, you know. What a wonderful story. All because of what? Of one man who decided He's got to do what he doesn't want to do. I hate my mother for what she's done. But you know, God broke his heart. And the day came where he heard about his mother. He came to know the Lord. Respond as soon as possible. Number two, react with a sincere apology and always seek forgiveness. Never blame anybody else for what you think they did. No, you're dealing with yourself. Be very, very careful. We often apply a revengeful heart towards somebody that we thought was also guilty. Hey, don't worry about what they face before God. It's you and me. We have to do it before the Lord. And realize the pain you've caused to others. 
I was speaking to a Bible study of about 50 people, and I was talking basically about marriage, and I spoke about this awful pain that we can cause by things that we have done. And I asked them all to put on a piece of paper either yes or no or I'm not sure about whether or not they cause pain in somebody's life. All 50 wrote down yes. You know, a lot of times we don't care I don't care. What happened, happened, and they have to suffer the consequences. No, 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 no. That is not the spirit of repentance in the Jewish prophets or in the New Testament. And number four, remember the consequences of continuing in this sin? A guy's business is falling apart. He came to me and he said, I don't understand it. I give my money to the church and it was like he was making a deal with God. I give him money to the church, therefore God should bless me? No, no, no. He's losing his business, why? Because he stole $60,000 from the company he worked for years ago and thought, they don't need it, they are wealthy, they got a lot of money, I don't need to deal with it. I said, oh yes you do. I've seen this over and over again, like the little girl, teenager, who was stealing from Robert Lazarus, his big store in Columbus, Ohio. Stealing regularly, she, piled, she didn't even know how much stuff she had stolen. And to really repent of her sin, she had to go in front of Mr. Lazarus himself. Instead of finding forgiveness, Mr. Lazarus told her, listen, if you wanna get straight on this, then you're gonna pay $10 a week, because that's, you don't have a job, $10 a week the rest of your life. She went out of there crying her heart out. Called me on the phone and she said, why did you ever preach on repentance? How am I ever gonna pay this off? $10 a week is a lot for me. And I said, well, didn't you steal more than that? You told me that. Yes, I stole hundreds and hundreds of dollars of things. I said, well, let's just start paying it back. Six months later, after she paid $10 a week, she got a letter from Mr. Lazarus. He said, after I saw you paying $10 a week, I knew that repentance was real with you. And he wrote across her invoice, paid in full canceled her debt. She wound up on the mission field. She was so excited for the Lord. Hey, recognize that this is a priority, is it? With you, is it? Is it, is it a priority to get right with God? Well, I don't even know where the people are. That's what the man told me about his parents, who he ran away from and has criticized them all his life. And I said, you need to get right with your mother and dad. Well, they don't like me and I don't like them. I said, listen, something's wrong in your heart. If this is the way it's going to be, you might as well go on to some other church because you're not going to be comfortable here. Well, God got a hold of his heart. And when he first wrote his parents, they thought it was a big sham and put up deal. As he continued, they eventually saw that his heart had changed. You see, what we need to do is to resolve to settle the matter in whatever ways are possible. Do you have to pay something back? Did you steal something from a place where you worked or with friends that you've never gotten straight? Can you restore, finally, whatever is possible to settle, settle the matter and to accept the consequences of it? Can you? The shame, the humiliation, the disgrace. By the way, the Jewish writers of the Old Testament spoke about those specific consequences. Wow. Repentance. Thank you for watching this broadcast from Vision Calvary Chapel, where we teach the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. 
Vision Calvary Chapel is located at 1279 West Henderson Avenue in Porterville, California. For more information about Vision, you can visit our Facebook page at Vision CCP, or you can visit our website at visioncalvary.org.